Uh, so we all know that schools uh, have the ultimate purpose or should have the ultimate purpose of turning uh, children into knowledgeable, interested uh, individuals, citizens of the world. But um, I know a lot of people, most of my friends, uh, that only became interested and aware and citizens of the world once they finished school and university, if they even went to university. Sorry, I have bronchitis <sighs> and stress. Um, <clears throat> so that could mean that schools fail in something very specific and something very important, capitalizing on youthful curiosity, which should be the tool for uh, learning. So this approach, um, which I propose, and well, scientists actually, and I just came to talk to you about it today, is um, an approach which, which could increase engagement um, to increase knowledge and, and learning. So the science of laughter is instructive uh, in showing us how beneficial humor could be for education. To put it simply, laughter decreases stress, uh, in concentration, and memory. And uh, in order to learn, you could um, you use memory to learn because you need to put a test or um, sorry, I don't know. Um, so anyway, um, an immense amount of research has been uh, is all around the internet about the benefits of employing humor as a tool for learning for all ages. Um, it needs to be done in an appropriate way because um, it could be dangerous when used in smaller with smaller ages because they could just go around and create havoc in the classroom. It needs to be employed as a tool. Thank you to my cousin for pointing that out. Um, <laughs> but it's very important because uh, it's very important to, to be used because students are in school five, six hours a day. They learn. It's very stressful. It's very difficult. And we need to find a way, as educators, as schools, as administrators, we need to find a way to get them interested into what we're saying, because they will need it for their futures, and we need them to come up with new solutions for the problems um, that are arising. Um, it could also help students. Sorry. That's fine. Okay. I don't feel like Madonna anymore, but that's fine. <laughs> Um, students who are less inclined um, to do well in school, either because they've been, uh, they've experienced more stress than other kids or they need something different, could be uh, engaged. Their engagement could be increased with the use of humor. So you actually end up doing your job better once you employ humor. So when I was 13, we were in Greek class, and we were learning about metoches. Metoches are words that finish in ondas. So one of my friends turns around and says, Miss, is Pocahontas a metohi? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we start laughing, uh, but the teacher didn't really like that because she thought that, I think, um, he wasn't listening or he, he just wanted to make fun of the lesson. But in fact... Uh, he was engaged because he internalized the lesson and he could joke about it. Um, and I still remember what Emetohi is, but I don't remember what any other part of language is. Uh, <laughs> so, therefore, memory is increased with laughter and with experiences. I remember the moment with my friend um, and what, what it was like in, class, in the classroom. So, um, this situation also shows... Uh, that as uh, Robert Povine wrote a book called uh, Laughter, a Scientific Investigation, he said, in a threatening situation, um, laughter could decrease that threatening situation. And uh, if the threatening person uh, joins in the laughter, then the threatening situation is totally eliminated. In a classroom, whether we like it or not, a teacher is the threatening person because they have the ability to take you to the headmaster or headmistress or uh, give you a bad grade or tell you off or make fun of you or uh, put you in a compromising position in the classroom. So with um, affiliative humor in the classroom, 
the relationship, the intimacy, the trust in a classroom is increased. And so uh, the teacher can then use this increased uh, trust and communication for, uh, for the lesson. So um, humor can therefore lighten the mood for learning and uh, adapt ideas, making them easier for students to absorb. Um, but as I said before, this does not mean dumbing down the content. That's very important. It could actually uh, um, make children internalize more complex uh, ideas than they would have normally. Um, humor can, can alter the school environment, uh, can alter the classroom environment, uh, making it more uh, adaptable for learning, uh, allowing for mistakes. This is very important. Um, Sorry, I really do have bronchitis, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, mistakes. Um, they are instructive for learning, they are integral for learning, and I don't think we understand this enough or we don't use it enough because we only get good grades by not making mistakes. But the learning process needs to include mistakes. It needs to include the ability both for students and for teachers to make mistakes. We need to really um, use that. Um, for example, in a classroom, when a teacher makes a mistake, perhaps they could uh, show with a humorous approach, with a more lighthearted approach, that mistakes are okay if the teacher makes them, and therefore when the student makes them, they can then learn from them instead of beating themselves up. Because without realizing, we create very stressful environments for students. Um, I'm a tutor, so I see a lot of that stress uh, every afternoon from schools. And teachers have their own stress in schools. They need to perform. They need to. They have deadlines. They have administrators. They have ministries, uh, and they have parents. So <laughs> you all know. Um, so I think it all begins in the classroom. If you, if you increase engagement, if you, in, if you decrease the distance between the student and the teacher in the class, classroom, a lot of the problems will go away. Uh, there's this phrase uh, that reads, um, children's minds are like wet cement. Anything that falls on them makes an impression. Um, it's a very scary uh, quote because it's like, we need to make sure that they know it's fun and they need to know that it's good to learn. They can do so many fascinating things with it. It shouldn't be this repressive, regimented uh, thing that they do called reading or studying or homework. Um, our system is increasingly showing them that it's stressful and that mistakes aren't um, acceptable. So um, with, with this approach, mistakes are integral and they're allowed. And the teacher is humanized, and therefore the classroom is humanized. Therefore, your content is humanized. They are, um, they're closer to it. It's not just words in a book, or they're not just um, numbers or concepts. They are something that they've interacted with, so they could then actually go about and learn it. Mel Brooks, comedian, has said, as long as the world is turning and spinning, we're going to be dizzy and we're going to make mistakes. So if Mel Brooks has said it, I think we should, you know, we should listen to him. So, um, and perhaps we could laugh about it as well. Um, physicists know that mistakes are integral to actually learning the mistakes of the universe. So if they know the mistakes, the, sorry, the mistakes, the secrets of the universe by making mistakes, by trial and error, I think there's something to learn there especially for, for kids learning science. So um, for, the, for the teacher, when, uh, when humor is employed, um, it's actually an approach which could uh, increase uh, class control. Because um, students, they only learn for like 20 minutes. Their, their attention span is not very um, long, especially with all those phones and uh, very short uh, attention span recently. So if you crack a joke before they end up getting bored or tired uh, with accumulating information, you give them a break and then you take the break back and you continue. So you are actually in control by knowing before your classroom gets tired or bored. They can't learn for 45 minutes or 40 minutes or a double period. It's, it's actually impossible. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
So it benefits both uh, both students and and teachers because um, there there is a much more communicative uh, relationship there. Um, <clears throat> so by employing uh, by employing this approach um, and you communicate with your students more, they'll they'll be freer to tell you, uh, okay, Miss, actually now we're tired, we're not going to listen, and then you can talk about it. Um, they'll they'll ask questions that perhaps they wouldn't have asked if they were feeling that you would um, you you wouldn't be as understanding as you would have been. Uh, so by humanizing yourself, you're you're improving your classroom. Um, by being by being a person in your classroom, uh, students will appreciate it. They'll see your character. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, teachers behave differently in staff rooms and differently in classrooms. I um, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't support this approach because they know they smell the difference. They know that you're different and you're just trying to be strict or uh, you're trying not to laugh and they just want to do things to annoy you or whatever. Um, um, if you if you want to increase the respect um, that students have of you, you need to show them that you're a person. They'll respect you more. Um, last year, uh, something happened. I was really upset in class, and they wouldn't they weren't like calming down. And I remember one of them started saying, uh, "Oh my God, uh, she's not well. Let's stop." So there was an interaction between them that. Actually, now it's time to stop joking because she's a person. I had humanized myself, and they had seen. And I think a lot of the problems in um, in uh, education today is that students aren't people enough. Uh, teachers aren't people enough. Sorry. Um, so last year uh, I was teaching the Russian Revolution, and uh, we had to learn about urbanization. Uh, urbanization is quite a tiring and boring concept for students. They don't understand the correlation to the communist revolution or anything to do with them today. Um, so I had sent them an email about some work they had to do, and I attached three songs. Stevie Wonder's Living for the City of the 70s, Elton John's Honky Cat of the 70s, and Costas Milioga's then Xanavosko Ales Vales of the 80s. And I had said, anyone who finds the correlation between these three songs uh, wins something. So I would go to school the next day. Nobody had found the correlation. Uh, but it had started a discussion about how silly I was and ha 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 ha, as if we would find it. Uh, and then we went to talk about urbanization and how urbanization is a concept that for hundreds of years, it was still an important concept to discuss. Elton John was talking about it, Stevie Wonder was talking about it, Cosas Mil Yogas, and it had developed into the communist revolution because of industrialization and all of that. So it, what, it started a conversation. Uh, they had laughed, um, they had connected the concepts, they had made fun of me. Um, so as an overall, what I'd like to say is that um, What humor does is humanize uh, the classroom. Uh, it facilitates communal learning. You learn as a classroom. Why be in a class if you're not going to learn together? And humor forms bonds. So why wouldn't a teacher want to do that? Um, and as an overall, I was reading a forum, an educational forum, and uh, someone had written this. No, not that. Humor equals human, and I think that's the overall appreciation of why we should use it in our classrooms.